before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta and this episode on Joffrey Borgia. Now, if you have been around for a while, you probably realize that I didn't open this video the way that I typically open my deep dive videos. I typically do like a teaser or a trailer at the beginning. But the reason why I'm not doing that for this video is because honestly, there's not a whole lot of information, valid information out there about Joffrey Borgia. I mean, literally, guys, I have one page of notes. Usually I have like 10 to 20 pages of notes based on the subject that we are covering. We are going to go through some stuff, though. A lot of Joffrey's story is very much intertwined with his sibling story, especially Cesare and Lucrezia. And of course, Cesare, Lucrezia, Juan Borgia, who we covered last week, and their father, Rodrigo Borgia. All those episodes are down in the description box below in case you want to me to want to find the elaborated story on these events that happened in Joffrey's life. And the interesting thing is, we know that with the Borgias, the most famous Borgias obviously are Rodrigo, who is Pope Alexander the Sixth. Um, Cesare, who literally was like the bad boy of the Vatican. He was the inspiration for the Jesus painting. And then, of course, Lucrezia. And, of course, Juan, their other brother, well, he's an un unsolved, he's a 500-year-old unsolved, unaliving, which is also very mysterious. But poor Joffrey, kind of like most babies of the family, kind of gets lost in the mix with this story. Now, with that being said, I am trying to do a deep dive into Sancha, who was Sancha of Aragon, who was Joffrey's wife. She was also lovers to Joffrey's brothers, Cesare and Juan. Now, I feel like they're, this woman, Sancha, is she like Lucrezia, she's very interesting to me. And the way Hollywood has portrayed her in any of these series or movies about the Borgias, they kind of portrayed her to be like a little hussy. And part of me kind of thinks that's not fair. And we're going to get into it. With that being said, a lot of the stuff I have found on Sancha is strictly in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish. But I have found a book, and I stumbled upon when I was trying to find any type of lectures or podcast on Sancha I could find. I stumbled upon a really small channel. So you guys, we know we like to help our fellow human beings out on this planet, on this channel we do. I'm going to place this girl's channel down in the description box below. It looks like she does like book reviews. And there is a book that was written in 2005 um, about Sancha and the Borgia dynasty. And this is called The Borgia Bride. And this girl does a book review on it. And I actually, because of her book review, I actually ordered the book. I know it's a fiction. Like it's not it's it, somebody wrote the book through the perspective of Sancha being married into this very um, high, uh, this crime family. And um, even though the story is, again, it's fiction based on historic facts, but fiction through the perspective of Sancha, I've ordered it just to kind of get it more of a feel of another perspective of Sancha, if that makes sense. So I feel like once I read that book, once I try to do even more digging, I might actually go to the library and see if I can actually old school find some books, historical books on Sancha that aren't in Spanish. Um, we might do a deeper dive into Sancha as well. And again, I'm going to be placing this girl's 
uh, YouTube channel down in the description box below. If you're an avid reader like I am, and if you're an independent thinker like I am, and if you want to help support other people who are out there doing the Lord's work and putting content out on YouTube, especially book reviews, go and give her a subscribe. It will really help her channel out. It will really help her algorithms out. And you know what? We all we all have a, a light to shine. Just because we support somebody else to get their light to shine bright does not diminish our own lights. And so let's help this girl get her channel out there because if it wasn't for her, I would have never heard of this book. And so anyway, down in the description box below. All right. So with that being said, there are, Joffrey was supposed to be the end of the Borgias, but again, we're, we're, I'm lo looking at doing a deep dive into Sancha. I've also stumbled upon some interesting descendants of the Borgias that I would like to do a deep dive on as well. So this isn't, this isn't necessarily the end of the Borgias, even though he is the baby of the Borgia clan um, and his story, there's not a lot out there. It's, it, it, there's more to come with that being said. So, Again, let's get into this. If you are new to this series, again, we've been deep diving the Borgia family. The Borgia family is probably one of history's first crime families. They were the inspiration for the Godfather movies. And if you've been around, you know that this is my favorite family in all of history. And it's my favorite family in all of history because they're so damn juicy. And they're so scandalous. With that being said, in no way do I want to live in the same time period as the Borgias. We got enough going on with the Clintons and that lot, but I would be terrified and probably wouldn't have the same perspective of them if I actually lived in the same time period as them. But being an onlooker, looking into their lives 500 years removed, it's super, super, super fascinating to me. And there's no denying that this family got up into some mischief. There's no denying that they, this family and, and the way that they worked really shines a pretty poor light on the Vatican because Rodrigo Borgia was Pope Alexander VI. But again, as I've said in many of these previous episodes, who's to say, like, this is just the way it was then. You know, life was, there's a very famous quote about history, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing it. I, I think it goes something like this, but it's, it's history is, history is like a foreign country. They do things differently there. We are conditioned for our time in history. We're not conditioned for Renaissance Italy. We would probably, none of us, if you to put us in a time machine and send us back to Renaissance Italy, I don't think any of us would survive because life was just savage. It was savage back then. It's savage now, but at least it's kind of behind closed doors savage. Like back then, between the have and the have nots, the mobility and the peasants, there there wasn't a whole lot the peasants could do to stop the no nobility from being little shits, right? So life was more savage. There was a lot of warring going on. Same today. We still have the same types of wars going on, but it's just different today, right? We have different technologies. We have different knowledges. It's just very different. And our perception of the Vatican is also different today. As we've said before in almost every single episode, it was very common back then for cardinals, archbishops, bishops, popes to have children. Yes, the children were illegitimate, but the only reason why the popes couldn't legitimize or the cardinals couldn't legitimize their children by marrying their mother was because of money. They didn't want to have, the Vatican did not want to have a court battle for all these children claiming some type of inheritance from the estates of the Vatican. They wanted to consolidate the wealth into the Vatican. But nonetheless, these illegitimate children of these cardinals and these popes were definitely used as pawns because the Vatican set sat at the top of the pyramid. So if we're looking at all of these royal families across Europe, all these kings and queens and royal courts, in a lot of ways they had to have permission and allotment from the Vatican in order to do things they wanted to do. And so to get the Pope or to get a cardinal in your favor, you could offer to basically bribery, bakshish, give their kid you know, a title in your country. And so it was very advantageous 
for the Vatican personnel, the employees will say the Vatican to have children to use as pawns. Very different today, right? Very different today in the way that the way that the Vatican is viewed. So, and anyway, if you want more information on that, all those videos, especially the Rodrigo Borgia video, the House of Borgia that I released, I go into detail about about how that was kind of set up. But nonetheless, Joffrey was the youngest child of Voneza and Rodrigo Borgia. It went Cesare, Juan, Lucrezia, Joffrey. And we talked a lot about Juan and Cesare and oldest child vibes and energy versus second child vibes and energy and the, the struggles the two of them had. Well, I definitely will say if Cesare is giving older brother vibes, Joffrey absolutely is giving baby of the family vibes. And again, his story is so enmeshed with his siblings that a lot of these things you're going to recognize from covering his siblings and even though again he's not one of the more famous borgias he's not cesare he's not lucrezia what's interesting is he might have the most descendants i'm not 100 percent sure about that i tried to follow his line because i thought well if we don't know a lot about joffrey let's look at his family let's see like what happened like where are they and the interesting thing is is that his descendants are not from Sancha. He never had children with Sancha, but he married Sancha's cousin. And through Sancha, he was able to hold lands as a prince, which then got passed down to his children. So let's get into it. So Joffrey Bor Borgia was born in 1481. So that was like, what, 11 years before his father, Rodrigo Borgia, became Pope Alexander II. He became Pope Alexander II in 1492. Now he died in 1517. He died in his 30s, which um, he outlived both Juan and Cesare. I mean, Lucrezia lived to 39. So Joffrey and Lucrezia both lived the longest as far as the Borgia children. So when Joffrey was 12 years old, the year after his father became the Pope, Joffrey was aligned to marry Sancha of Aragon. Now this is a fully political marriage. Sancha's brother Alfonso of Aragon had been married to Lucrezia. And I will again tag that down below. You can go into more detail about Alfonso's marriage to Lucrezia. That was the one marriage that, that was like the love of Lucrezia's life. So Sancha and Alfonso are siblings marrying siblings. Now like Lucrezia, Joffrey was super, super, super young when the wedding took place. The agreement was made when he was 12. They got married in 1494, right, right before his 13th birthday. So he was technically still 12, about to turn 13, and Sancha was 16. Now, 12 and 14, four years difference, that's not that big of a deal when you're in your 20s or your 30s or your 40s. But a 12-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl, that's a huge ma maturity difference. Now, with Joffrey and Lucrezia, again, they both were promised in these political marriages at very young ages. Lucrezia's first marriage was to Schwarza, and she herself was only like 12 or 13. Now, again, the difference is with Lucrezia is that they needed to make sure she actually had her period before they sent her off to her new husband because she's the one that's got to bear the children. And once you have a child, you're now really intertwined as a family and it gets into like blood rights and all that kind of stuff. Now with Joffrey, there was a little bit of concern too, because he was so young, very, very, I mean, my nephew is 11. He'll be 12 in November. So basically my nephew is the same age as Joffrey when Joffrey was married to Sancha. And that is just bananas to me. That is bananas to me. Like, you to remind 11 year old, 12 year old boys to like take a shower, you know, like this is bananas that this little boy is being married off to the 16 year old girl. Now I, I, they taught in, in some of the Hollywood productions, like the Showtime series, they do talk about how young he is, how concerning it is because he's still playing with his toys when he's arranged to get marriage, married, but I don't think it's as concerning for them at this time as it was for Lucrezia because she was the girl, right? So the girl's the one that has to receive, if you know what I mean, in the marital bed, when the boy's the one that has to give. But 12-year-old boys, I don't know many 12-year-old boys who are super interested in, I mean, maybe they're a little interested in girls, but they're not, you know, I think they're happier playing with their G.I. Joes and their blocks. And that's kind of how Joffrey was portrayed, even though he was married off to the 16-year-old girl. So looks-wise, 
they look very far apart in maturity, he was still more interested in playing with his toys. He's 12. Of course, of course he was. I mean, this is a 16-year-old girl is more like a babysitter to a 12-year-old boy. Now, Sancha was the illegitimate daughter of King Alfonso II of Naples and one of his mistresses. So she's illegitimate as well. But King Alfonso had given her some titles, as some of these other illegitimate children were given by their parents. In courts, an illegitimate child is not going to be recognized, but a parent could recognize the illegitimate child at this time as one of their own. Nowadays, it's different. Regardless of whether your parents are married or not, a court is going to recognize you as the rightful inheritor of your parents' estate. Very different now as it was then. So if you guys remember back to um, Rodrigo's episode, the house, or excuse me, not even Rodrigo's episode, let's back up even further to Pope Innocent VIII, which I'll tag that down below too. We covered him before we got into the Borgias, just so we had a feeling, we had a vibe for what the world was like when Alexander, Pope Alexander, Alexander takes the papal throne. We talked about the Black Museum. All right. So this was a very disturbing museum by King Ferdinand I of Naples. Y'all remember this? Like, I'm trying not to be too grotesque. This was a king that would take his enemies once his enemies were unalived and he would stuff them like one would do with an animal. I don't even think we should be doing that with animals, but nonetheless, you guys probably know what I'm talking about when you see a hunter stuffing like deer or bears. That's what this dude would do to his enemies. And he would set up their corpse, their stuffed corpse, like at a dinner table. And he would parade his enemies alive enemies through this black museum as it was called to kind of freak them out a little bit like oh my god if we piss this guy off we're gonna be stuffed and we're gonna be put in this grotesque museum well king ferdinand the first of naples is king alfonso the second of Na naples father so ferdinand the first is sancha's grandfather and if you do watch the at least the showtime series with Jeffrey Irons playing Alexander the Sixth, you see this. Sancha gives a tour when they come down to, to to the Kingdom of Naples to like negotiate the marriage between Sancha and Joffrey. Sancha gives Juan Borgia a tour of her grandpappy's museum. So these are the families that we're dealing with, right? Not saying anything again in saying that I, I want to be very clear, especially with my newer subscribers. Generally speaking, these families were kind of nasty and like kind of bad and nefarious. However, as I always say, we have to look at people as individuals. So even though someone hails from a corrupt family or even though someone hails from a family where your grandfather is stuffing his enemies does not mean that the granddaughter is anything like her family, right? DNA only goes so far. You have free will and free will choice. And so I think that's super important, especially moving forward in our own timeline when certain truths are being revealed about particular families in the establishment that we be very, very, very careful. And I'm talking to myself as well, um, not to judge individuals too quickly because everybody has free will and no one can help who they were born to, right? You, you can't, you don't, you're not in control of what your family name is. So... I want to kind of give Sancha some benefit of the doubt, too, when it comes to this. Again, a lot of these Hollywood productions do kind of portray her as being a little bit like a hussy. Um, and maybe she was. I don't know. But I, I, I want to say that, especially when we looked at, like, Lucrezia, we were very fair with Lucrezia. At this point in, in history, I've said it a million times. I'll say it again, especially as a woman myself. If I, If somebody came to me and said, Bryce, we have to take you back to 15th century Italy, you got to live in the Renaissance, but you get to pick your position in the Renaissance. Like, are you going to be nobility, a peasant? Hands down, I would take peasantry. Hands down, especially as a woman. It is my opinion that the women in the peasantry class in the Italian Renaissance and other places of Italy or of Europe at this time, especially, the peasantry class women had way more autonomy and way more rights within their own communities than these noble women. Okay, women in general were not autonomous beings. 
they were property of their fathers or their husbands or their brothers. They were definitely used as political pawns. So a, that's the value of a princess, right? So if you have a prince, especially in like nobility, if you have a prince, he's going to be the king one day. But the princess is a bargaining tool that you can do to marry off to other royal houses to create alliances. Same thing with the Vatican, same, same, especially since Italy at this time is not a political entity, but more principalities. Okay, so we have this royal family that, that comes from Spain that's royal, ruling Naples. The Borgias also hail from Spain. The Borgias are interested in getting their stakes in different principalities of Italy to create more dominance, more, more world dominance for this dynasty. And so it's very important that the children of the Borgias marry into particular families to strengthen that bond. So Sancha is a tool for the king of, of Naples to marry her off to Joffrey Borgia, marry his son off to Lucrezia Borgia, because now he can also in return get more favors from the Pope. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Let's bargain with our children. It's gross. I mean, it's gross, but this is the truth of, of the time. So Sancha, at this point, as a 16-year-old, is married off to a 12-year-old. Now, Sancha, as we know, does end up having a relationship, an intimate relationship with both Juan Borgia and Cesare Borgia. So she becomes a mistress to the two. Now, according to the book review I heard on this Awesome Girls channel about the Borgia Bride, the writer takes a very different perspective on this relationship that Sancha had with Juan and Cesare. And that's why I'm interested in reading this book. Because again, I think we portrayed her and we thought about her as being like a hussy. But it might have been, that's not the case. She could have been RAPE'd. She also, we're looking at a 16-year-old girl who's cl more close, she's closer in age to Juan and Cesare. So Juan and Cesare are age appropriate for her. Joffrey is 12. She's 16. She's not interested in Joffrey in an intimate way. He's a child still. And according to what I did read about the speculations on their relationship is that Sancha saw him as such. She was more motherly to Joffrey than wifey to Joffrey. It is said that Sancha was known to be a beauty. So even Lucrezia, who was also known to be a beauty, apparently was a little jealous of Sancha. Sancha's brother Alfonso, who was Lucrezia's second husband, was also known, as we spoke about, to be very, very good looking. So Joffrey, being a 12-year-old, being married to this beautiful 16-year-old, was head over heels in love with her. Even though he probably didn't really understand intimacy at that point, it's just a very awkward dynamic, right? But nonetheless, they get married. All right, so Sancha and Alfonso, both in marrying into the Borgias, move to the Vatican. And this is where Sancha and Alfonso especially will end up basically spending the rest of their lives in the Vatican Palace with the Borgias. Now, another interesting tidbit about the family in Naples, especially with Sancha and Alfonso, is that through their mother's line, they're also Orsini's. So their mother had a great uncle named Giovanni Antonia del Palazzo Orsini. So we know the Orsinis are another big family in Italy at this time. We know that Lucrezia was tutored by the Orsinis. We also know that the Orsinios, Orsinis struggle with the Borgias, that there's a lot of tension between these two families. This particular Orsini, though, just so you guys know, because this gets even juicier, was considered the king of Jerusalem. So after the Crusades, when the Christendom took over Jerusalem, he was titled the king of Jerusalem. Which is wild because we know Cesare Borgia is the inspiration for the Jesus painting that da Vinci did. So it just shows you how crooked, how crooked religion really is. But nonetheless, I digress. So when Joffrey and Sancha get married, because Sancha's the girl and she's not an autonomous human being, all these titles that Sancha has with her birth through her father's line, through her mother's Orsini line, fall on Joffrey as the husband. So out of all the Borgia children, even though Cesare marries into the French royal family, which we're going to get to in a minute because it affects Joffrey and Sancha, Joffrey like racks up titles. And I don't think people think, this is why, like when I'm doing research, and this is why I spent a long time researching Joffrey, even though I couldn't find much, but I, I, you got to dig through their family, like dig through their family. Because if you don't dig through 
Like when I started looking into Sancha and digging through her family, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't even realize the connection that they have to the Orsinis. And I would never realize the connection that they have to Jerusalem, which then ding, 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 rings bells with uh, the Da Vinci painting of Cesare and how just fucked up this whole thing really, really is. But nonetheless, Sancha is a big ticket item. She is like the Tiffany's jewelry compared to like the fake cheap crap, right? She's like score. Like the Borgias have scored with her. And she's so enmeshed. Again, she's married to Joffrey. She's boinking both Juan and Cesare. She's so enmeshed in this family. Her brother's also enmeshed in this family. By marrying Sancha, the Borgias could massively expand their empire. Now you might be asking if Joffrey is the youngest and Sancha was like, he was not mature enough. Why didn't they just marry Sancha to Juan or Cesare while well, they were already taken. I mean, we, we talked about that with Juan. Cesare was in the cloth until he wasn't in the cloth. So Joffrey was literally the only option. Like, if you're going to marry this girl and get all these titles for the Borgia family, including the Orsini's claim on the King of Jerusalem, and that whole sh that whole shit show, you got to marry Joffrey to her. Times were very, very different. They were just very different back then. Anyway, they get married. Alfonso also hands over a huge dowry, like the Borgias needed any more money. But nonetheless, here we are. So Sancha is the princess of Squillace, which is a, an area of southern Italy. So guess what? Joffrey now becomes the prince of Squillace. And this is gonna, this is what I'm telling you guys. Like, even though Joffrey, there's not a lot of information because he's so enmeshed with his siblings. This Squillace is super important because dude still has like descendants who are like ruling that area of Italy to this day. Now, y'all know I love a good conspiracy. You know, I love a good legend, but you also know I'm, I have a lot of discernment when it comes to com some conspiracies. But with this situation, I'm seeing a pattern here, especially with all the bloodlines that are mixed with the Borgias now with the Orsini's the Medecis, and now we've got a tons of descendants of these kids that are still, like, ruling the roost. And if you're from, if you happen to be from Squillace in South Italy, let me know about these Borgia shenanigans down there with, through Joffrey. Because Joffrey might not have much of a story, but I guarantee you guys, some of his ancestors probably do, we're going to be on the hunt. We are going to be on the hunt to continue this story. But nonetheless, he becomes the Prince of Squillace, with Sancha the princess, even though they're living in Rome, Roma, in the Vatican. And he's got this dowry. Meanwhile, he's just happy to play with his blocks and his, you know, <laughs> Renaissance edition G.I. Joes. I don't know what little boys played with back then, but he's just, and, 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 and Sancha's having these affairs with Cesare and Juan. She becomes really good friends with Lucrezia because Lucrezia is married to a brother, right? So they, they become one big enmeshed incestual family. And then 1500 happens. It's the turn of the century. We're going from the 15th century to the 16th century. And all of a sudden, as you guys know from previous episodes, Rodrigo Borgia, a.k.a. Pope Alexander VI, is not super interested in Naples anymore. Instead, he has his eyes set on France. And France is slowly encroaching into Italy to take power in some of these duchies. And he starts looking at France. And we know that King Charles in France had passed away, as we spoke about before with Cesare. And then we've got Louis XII. And we know that Louis XII, y'all, check the gossip on this, this son of a bitch, he was married to this one princess, a Valois, and he decides that he wants to annex Brittany, the north of France, onto France. Like, of course, he wants to annex this peninsula. And so he can't, though. Like, there's no way he can do that unless he does it through marriage. But he's already married. Like, like shucks. I'm already, or I'm already married. I gotta, you know, figure this out. And so he goes to Pope Alexander VI, who grants annulments. And he's like, yo, bro, listen. Listen, my friend. I want to annex Brittany onto France. The only way I can do that is if I marry that princess over there. But problem. We got a problem because I'm already married to this, this girl. 
can we like fix this? Can you just annul us so I can marry this chick? And Alexander goes, yeah, that can be cool. We can totally do that. It's totally fine. I can totally annul it for you. However, if I do this for you, if I like annul this, this wedding so that you can marry this other chick and annex Brittany, you got to do something for me. You see, you see King Louis the 12th, my son, Cesare is now out of the church. You know, my other son, Juan, died. We don't know what happened to him. The unsolved mystery, whatever. So now, Cesare, I'm putting a lot of, of pressure on Cesare. And so, it would really be cool if you can marry Cesare to one of your family members. So, Cesare can become, like, a real prince. I mean, you've already given him a dukedom, which is basically a, a prince. But, like, if he were to marry one of your family members... And like have a kid with one of your family members that would like really solidify us into a royal house and so louis the 12th goes sure no problem no problem whatsoever see i got this cousin down in navarre and he has a sister her name is charlotte so we can marry them and so therefore cesare is now in my family like as a royal family member and the pope goes cool yeah cool and so he annuls louis the 12th's marriage so he can annex Brittany. cesare marries charlotte in navarre they have the daughter louise which we've spoken about before which really you know mm, gets them into that 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 um the french royal family and um now cesare is going to be invading naples with the french military so we have a big problem now though Right? Like, what are we going to do? Because Lucrezia and Joffrey are married to the ruling family of Naples. Well, we know what happens to Alfonso, Lucrezia's husband. Watch the episode if you don't. And Cesare was probably very much involved in that unaliving. But Sancha is still another story. So Joffrey is still tied to the Naples family while his other part of his family is now aligned with France, which is also an enemy of Spain, which we talk about with Cesare, which Spain is ruling Naples, even though the Borgias themselves are Spanish. It's such a soap opera, you guys. Like, I, this is side note for new viewers. Like, I don't understand. I, it, it, I don't, doesn't compute. Like, people who don't like history doesn't compute with me. I'm like, this is the juiciest stuff. Do you not understand how freaking juicy and petty? And this is like Melrose Place with syphilis because they all had syphilis too. Like this is freaking Melrose Place. You don't under, this is juicy and it's petty. It's better than any reality show you'll ever watch because this shit really happened, right? So um, nonetheless, Sancha's like, oh no, my brother has been unalived. My sister-in-law is in deep mourning. She's had a child, Rodrigo, she named after her father and in, in hopes that her father would not like unalive her husband and her sister-in-law. Oh no. And so Sancha gets arrested because she's the princess of Naples. And the Borgias are siding with the French now. So Sancha has to go live at the mausoleum of Hadrian which we spoke about last week because that's where they took Juan's body. This is before. No, this, I'm sorry, this was after, long after Juan had been. So she has to go and live in captivity with, she goes to jail with her nephew, Lucrezia's son. Because remember, Lucrezia gets married to another person and she can't see her son anymore. And so Sancha has to take guardianship over Rodrigo, because she's the paternal aunt. And so the baby and her are in captivity, in prison, in this mausoleum, in the middle of Rome for three years. She is only released once Pope Alexander VI dies. And again, he either died of malaria or poisoning. I know common sense ain't so common, but I think... You guys that probably know which of the two it was. So in 1503, she's released from prison. She never lives with Joffrey again. Like she never sees her husband again. And on top of that, she's walking out with her nephew, her young nephew that she's 
has guardianship over. And then Cesare finds her and he's like, yo, good to see you, sister-in-law. I haven't seen you in a long time. We used to boink too. Hey, guess what? We have this other kid. You guys remember the Roman infant, Giovanni? The one from, from Lucrezia where they didn't know if it was like Lucrezia's baby or if it was Rodrigo's baby or if the baby was a product of incest. Remember that? If you missed it, that episode's in the Lucrezia video. Well, Cesare presents this kid to her, too, and says, we got this kid. Can you raise him as well? So Sancha, who's been imprisoned for three years just because of who her father is, been responsible for her nephew because her brother was unalived by this horrific family, and then the main assassin for this horrific family family comes and finds her and gives her another kid and says raise him too now i can understand as an aunt i absolutely no problem would take my nephews or nieces any day of the week like no worries and i probably would also take another child if it was handed to me because i'm not a freaking ogre and i imagine that's how Sa sancho was like but she's being strapped down with all these children okay now she ends up passing away of an illness in 1506 so she never gets like annulled from Joffrey or anything. They, ne they never had children. I don't even know if the two ever boinked. Like that, if I'm going to be completely honest, like I don't know if they ever even boinked. But she passes away in 1506. She was only like 27 or 28 years old. Very, very young. But Joffrey, nonetheless, is still the prince of this area of Italy. He still maintains all these titles. Now, some of the titles, King Ferdinand II of Spain, of Aragon, you know, the one who sent Christopher Columbus to explore America does take some of the titles back from Joffrey, but nonetheless, he keeps the important ones, the ones that his ancestors are still like sporting today. Now, when France does invade, so backing up a little bit, when Sancha gets arrested in 1500 and sent to the mausoleum with her nephew, Joffrey sides with the French. He's like, what, 19 at this time? He like joins his brother Cesare to fight with the French. Yay. But then he gets captured. And so he turns and now supports the Spanish. Yay. So he's just going back and forth between whatever is going to keep him alive, probably, which I don't, I don't blame him. Once Sancha passes away, he then marries one of Sancha's cousins. And this is a woman named Maria de Mila. Now, they had multiple children together. So the son was Francesco Borgia de Mila. He became the prince after Joffrey passed away. They had three daughters, Lucrezia, Antonia, and Maria. And it is through these four children that the Borgias maintained control of South Italy for a very long time. I'm going to be looking more into the children as time goes on, as well as Sancha, because I smell a rat. Now, Joffrey himself did die around the age of 35 again. So he didn't, he lasted longer than his older two brothers. But nonetheless, as I said, even though Joffrey himself, there's not a lot of information about him independently. And no, he was not one of the more scandalous Borgia siblings. I do think there's more of a story here with Sancha and his own children, who I will be looking into. We're also going to be looking at some famous descendants of Juan of Borgia next, too. I mean, it just gets so juicy, you guys. Like, honestly, this stuff is so fascinating because, I mean, this is like life. These people, you know, they were human beings that were experiencing more scandals, more threats to their life than we will ever possibly know or understand <laughs> thus quest renaissance italy this is where like the mafia comes from you know so anyway you guys i hope that you are all having a wonderful wonderful day we have our our third installment of the pesor family coming out on friday Plus, we will be obviously continuing with our deep dives into the stigmata. I've got a long list of stuff. I am going to be covering that that witch that was spoken about in the Pesor um, part one. I will be covering. I've got her on my list. And so she will be coming up as like a bonus episode as well. Because you guys know I love a good witch story. So anyway, guys, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. Please do not forget to check out our sponsors, Spooky2 and Miramate. These are both two companies they're their sister companies to each other spooky two is a rife machine that's vibrational healing whereas mirror made is a mat that's also a vibrational healing and if you enter my name bryce watson at checkout you get five percent off 
any purchase you make from them. All that information is down below. We also have our panel. If you like this stuff, if you like conspiracies, you like the occult, learning about all this salacious stuff that's happened in our own timelines, we have a exclusive an exclusive event happening on Gnostic TV. We have a panel of people who survived the occult, who are born into these Borgia-esque families, if you know what I mean. The establishment starts with an I and ends with a Anate. You know what I mean? They were born into these families. They experienced all of these shenanigans that these children, the Borgias, were subjected to. And they live to tell the tale. They live to escape the cult and talk about it to you. We've also got people on that panel who are also deep researchers who research into current events that are happening and past current events where maybe what really happened isn't quite what it seems. So please, if you would like to join this exclusive event, this panel, uh, Tales from the Dark Side, please text EVENT. The word event to 321-216-8047. That's event to 321-216-8047. If you are texting from a country outside of the United States, please put plus one before the phone number. All that's in the description box too. And you will be sent a link to get a ticket to this event. It, because it's online, it's not in person, it's online. So anybody is welcome from any part of the world. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful week. What a crazy freaking week this is. Buckle up, buttercups. Here we go. And I will talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.